One of the uh, characteristics of human beings is uh, uh, that, among other things that they do, is that they solve problems. And what it means, of course, to solve a problem is uh, being able to not only get an answer to uh, a question that arises in a particular situation, but then uh, to find other cases that are similar to the initial one, so that we are, in effect, in a position to solve not just one concrete problem, but a whole class of them. This is so Professor example, Ernest Nagel, uh, the leading uh, logician and philosopher when, from uh, Columbia uh, University. Once a domain has been developed to the point where uh, answers can be uh, given from given set of assumptions uh, simply by following uh, some uh, set of instructions or uh, some rules, then it's not entirely evident that one should be thinking of the significance of every step that one is performing. Well, is it also possible to instruct machines to follow the rules of thought? Indeed, I think this is, of course, uh, the basis for having uh, machines or computers uh, since their uh, entire task consists in following a set of rules or programs uh, so that uh, in a very uh, short uh, span of time uh, they're able to come out with an answer uh, that would have taken uh, human beings an extraordinary length of time to produce. Mathematics has been called the one universal language of mankind. It is perhaps our most powerful tool for problem solving. And in terms of subject matter, pure mathematics and logic are one and the same. The subject matter consists in the relations generally expressed by if, then necessarily. Computers have been called machines for logic. The human problem solver must first define the problem he must also provide the machine with instructions as to the steps necessary to solve the problem. And then the machine will carry out these instructions accurately and with fantastic speed. All of this, of course, requires very precise logical thinking on the part of the problem solver. It is the machine's power to carry out these logical operations that gives it its great value as a tool for extending man's thought. It is essential to logic and mathematics that, given a set of premises, the conclusion will follow in all cases. Results from a computer are the necessary conclusions arising from the data and rules of operation provided the machine by the human programmer. And yet, these conclusions can accurately reflect and foretell real-life situations. What is the nature of this remarkable correspondence between the abstract symbols of mathematics and logic and the real perceptible world of objects and events. We ask Professor Nagel to comment on this. Well, I, I would like to uh, say something about that, because this has been, uh, I suppose, for many, many centuries, a problem that has occupied uh, men, uh, and uh, because of the apparent uh, agreement of what we might call reality or nature with the language that we employ, whether it is ordinary English or whether it is the language of mathematics, uh, the apparent agreement uh, between reality and uh, the symbolic representation, uh, men have speculated about, uh, sometimes about the origin of the world, uh, something about uh, the necessity of there being some particular uh, kind of creative agency and so if one asks why is it that the consequences of assumptions that we make are in agreement with na in nature the answer is because nothing can count as an instance of the assumptions that we make unless the assumptions themselves are conferred uh, so that rather than saying as for example uh, the late uh, so James Jeans maintained that the fact that mathematics is used in exploring nature, uh, he maintained that this shows that uh, 
there must have been a divine creator, that, and moreover that the creator was a mathematician, in terms of this uh, simple reminder of the sorts of things that enter into applying any formal system to any segment of nature, uh, one would have to say the reason why nature conforms uh, to our assumptions uh, is not that there was a mathematician who created it, but simply that nothing would count as an instance of the assumptions unless it also conformed to whatever consequence was deduced from it. The problem-solving power of mathematics and logic, combined with the speed and accuracy of a machine for carrying out these operations, is the basis of the computer revolution. But does this mean that a computer can produce a new idea or make an original contribution to knowledge? Well, the question is to whether uh, machines or computers are capable of uh, original thought or of making uh, original contributions to knowledge uh, is a very much debated one, but before one can profitably discuss it, it seems to me it's very important to distinguish between two senses in which uh, a statement or an idea might be said to be original. The two senses are a psychological sense of originality and a logical sense of originality. And I think uh, perhaps the best way of making the distinction clear is first with an illustration. Uh, when a child is given a, an elementary arithmetical problem, for example, to find the sum of two numbers, uh, when he gets the answer, uh, the conclusion is something that is novel or new to him. So psychologically, of course, he gets the sense of having made a discovery. Uh, nevertheless, the answer is, is something that is necessarily or logically implied in the premises or the assumptions. Uh, and the process of thought here simply is to unravel or make explicit what was already contained in a logical sense in the premises. I think I'd risk uh, uh, going out on a limb here and say that it seems to me that uh, at least on the basis of our present conceptions of the capacities of uh, computers as well as the actual ones that have been constructed, that uh, uh, computers do not come up with logically new ideas and uh, unless the nature of the beast changes very radically, that they cannot come up with logically new ideas, given the assumptions that underlie the present theory of computers. I think we have to say that uh, in this respect, uh, the human mind is capable of doing things that uh, none of the machines that are uh, available today is capable of doing. This certainly doesn't foreclose the question whether sometime in the future uh, machines might not be devised so that uh, uh, exactly this kind of a thing will be credited to machines. But at present, and this is all that one can say at the moment, uh, there, is, there are clear lines of demarcation between the capacity of the human mind in respect to uh, the capacity to make contributions to knowledge which is our original. I do think that uh, as a consequence of these increased uh, com complexities in society and the uh, obviously greater uh, degree of control that will have to be uh, uh, exercised if we are not going to run into each other constantly, uh, it does uh, require to think seriously as to how in the future uh, we, or perhaps more specifically our children and grandchildren uh, will be able to realize the potentialities uh, that we would like our own society to uh, enable us to develop. We shall have to find ways of training ourselves how to enjoy the leisure that we presumably are going to have, the greater leisure that we're going to have, in such a way that instead of being frustrating and making life a perpetual boredom, 
will enable us to engage in uh, creative activities. This seems to me uh, to be the central problem that faces uh, Western civilization insofar as the material goods of life are going to be increased, but it does uh, raise a fundamental uh, issue as to how what was sometimes called the spiritual aspect of, of life, or uh, I would prefer to call it the creative aspect of individuality, will be given uh, a, a room for development. Now, there's no simple answer to this question.